On Life and Meaning is brought to you by Blumenthal Performing Arts, celebrating its 25th year presenting the best in the performing arts, sharing and employing the arts as a major catalyst to strengthen education, building community cohesiveness, and advancing economic growth. Further support is provided by Foundation for the Carolinas, inspiring philanthropy and empowering individuals to create a better community. And by the Arts and Science Council, Charlotte Mecklenburg's resource hub and lead advocate for the regional cultural community, providing culture for all. Happiness isn't the absence of trauma, tragedy, and loss. It's really about how we choose to move through it. And a key piece of that is that we are not alone and we need to reach out to others. In fact, it has long been established that having close, authentic connection with others doesn't prevent us from suffering tragedy, loss, or trauma, but it significantly decreases the emotional and physical impact that it has on us. And having done this in my own life and finally making the decision to stop running and stop hiding has been crucial in my personal happiness and also in my recovery from these various traumas. Howard Slutsky is a professor of psychology at Johnson & Wales University. He has a particular interest in the areas of emotional intelligence, positive psychology, and mindfulness. Howard offers numerous health and wellness workshops on relationships, stress reduction, grief and loss, dream interpretation, and coping with medical issues. He has worked in a variety of clinical settings, including community health, college counseling, and private practice. In this episode, we explore teaching psychology, interpreting dreams, surviving leukemia, overcoming personal trauma, and living authentically. I'm Mark Paris, and this is On Life and Meaning. Howard, welcome. Thank you, Mark. Howard, there have been two traumatic events in your life that you've had to confront and overcome, and we will explore each. I'd like to begin with the work that you are doing now that informs how you approach and value life. What is it that you do? I am a full-time professor at Johnson & Wales University. This is my 13th year teaching, and I also have a clinical practice on the side part-time where I do evaluations for social security disability. I've also done some private counseling as well. What classes do you teach? So I was hired to teach introductory psychology, and that's the only required course for a lot of our students, but there was a, a strong positive reaction to that class. So students uh, were requesting additional classes. So we've added social psychology, human sexuality, and abnormal psychology. Howard, your intro to psychology class is so popular on campus. Is there a topic that you particularly enjoy teaching in that class? Absolutely. So I certainly uh, love all the topics. You know, this is my industry, but there are several topics that really captivate students and things that they will remember. One of them is covered in a chapter on neuropsychology and biopsychology, and it looks at an issue called alien hand syndrome. And most people haven't heard of this. Uh, however, there's an episode of House that actually covers this extremely well called Both Sides Now. So this is an issue where someone suffering from uncontrollable seizures has the opportunity or option as a last resort to cut part of their brain, ba basically cut the bundle of nerves that connects left and right hemispheres. And that actually reduces the seizure symptoms, but it now leaves each hemisphere acting independently. So the left side of the body, controlled by the right hemisphere, takes on a life of its own, literally, um, will act independently from our conscious thought. So I actually introduced this topic by demonstrating, without letting the students know that I'm doing so, I look towards the PowerPoint slide and start covering the material, and my left hand starts giving them the finger. And I throw a marker against the wall but all the time unaware that I'm doing this. So the students are captivated, and then I break character and explain to them what's happening, and we discuss the topic further. Funny story, I was being evaluated for promotion, and it so happened that one of the people on the promotion committee 
without letting me know that he was coming to observe me that day, came to observe. And so he literally observed me for promotion while throwing markers against the wall and giving my middle finger to the students. Howard, what you just shared is an example of how you teach many of your lessons, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, I I think active engagement. We hear that a lot. We have trainings and seminars on engaging students, but what does that actually look like? And for me, shock value, um, captivating students while also providing them information to go along with that really helps the material stay with them and, and really forges a deeper understanding. Howard, why do you think psychology classes are so popular? You know, I feel like I teach the best subject here on campus because no matter what industry people are going into, they absolutely find psychology captivating. And a lot of it is relevant to their personal lives, their relationships, their own emotional struggles. But some of it is just downright fascinating. I hope none of my students ever get alien hand syndrome, but they are never going to forget that topic. So I think it's the course lends itself to that strong interest. But I also think teaching style is important as well. And I I relate to the students well and really draw their interest and help them feel respected and safe. I really feel that students want to know themselves better. They want to improve their relationships. I think a lot of students self-diagnose as well. We do cover various uh, disorders. So I think they're very interested in that. And quite honestly, a lot of students gain information from me in a safe environment that they have never heard before, which really helps open their eyes to certain things and resources to help them. And it also depathologizes them and normalizes a lot of things. So for that reason, I I know students find my classes very therapeutic, even though I'm not officially or ethically able to do therapy for them. Howard, do you think we can ever know ourselves? Hmm. I think we think we know ourselves, but I believe that the most evolved people are those that realize that evolving is a continuing process. And we can know ourselves or think we know ourselves well at one stage of life or one portion of our experiences. But if we lock ourselves into that, then we really close ourselves off to expanding and evolving. So um, there's a great story that I remember from an author, one of my favorite authors, Back when I was in college, Dan Millman wrote Way of the Peaceful Warrior, um, as well as several other books. But that was the first of his that I read. And there's a story in that book. He speaks of a young student in search of enlightenment. And he starts hiking this ancient mountain in search of enlightenment. And as he's hiking the mountain, climbing and climbing, he comes across a man, elderly and wise in years, with a sack on his back, hunched over, climbing down the mountain. So the young student thinks this person might have some wisdom to share. So he asked him, excuse me, sir, you know, you seem wise in years and experience. Could you share with me what is enlightenment? So without saying a word, the man takes the sack off of his back, places it on the ground and stretches up. And so the young student has an aha moment. He says, I see. Wow. Okay. Well, what happens after enlightenment? The man smiles picks up the bag, puts it back on his back, hunched over, and continues down the mountain. And I think that's a great lesson, certainly one that has been very relevant for me. I think I know myself at various stages, and then either life experiences or just maturation, new relationships, new insights occur that really shift and sometimes completely alter previous worldviews and and self-perceptions. Howard, there are several workshops that you lead on campus as well. What are some of those workshops? Some of my favorites include Mirror Mirror, which is on body image, eating disorders, and self-esteem, and it addresses issues for both males and females. I do a workshop called Tipping the Scales, which looks at the psychology and some of the science and nutrition about successful diet, fitness, weight loss. I do one called Stress Busters, which is relevant to everyone, looking at stressors and how to better cope with and manage those stressors and not fuel those stressors, which many of us do. And one of my favorites is Dreamweaver, which is a workshop on the mystery and science of dreams and dream interpretation. Howard, how do you go about interpreting dreams? Well, it started with interpreting my own dreams <laughs> and friends coming to me up into workshops, trainings on dream interpretation. And since you ask, during the workshop on Dreamweaver, I actually start the workshop by sharing with students a dream that was presented to me by a potential client. So I received a phone call from a woman uh, in my private practice. She wanted to schedule an appointment. 
Normally, I like to get a little information just to make sure I'm the best fit. So she shared with me that she has been plagued by a recurrent nightmare. Normally, I would wait until the first session. That's good practice. But I felt moved to ask her about the nightmare. So she shared with me the following nightmare. She stated that she was in her bed. There's a monster of some sort that was attacking her, holding her down. It wasn't sexual in nature. I did ask her that. But what I did ask her was, what were you feeling in the dream? Because a lot of dreams are disguised. They are symbolized. But the feelings are not. So I go straight for that. What were you feeling in the dream? And she said, powerless and helpless. And so I asked her, when in your waking life have you felt most powerless and helpless? And she paused. There was a silence. And she started crying. And she shared with me when my son died. She said those words when my son died. So I asked, when did your son die and how did he die? He was affected with cancer. And despite all of her efforts to take him to the best doctors, to seek all the proper resources, he didn't make it. And she wanted to be there for her surviving son and for her husband. So she suppressed all of her emotions, all of her guilt. So she had such a release just in that phone conversation. When she finally came to see me less than a week later, I asked her, how often have you had the dream since we've talked? And she said, not at all. So it's not that her work was done. It's that the unconscious was brought to conscious and now we had some work to do. Her honoring her own grief and her own guilt and working through that, which she did beautifully. So I share that with my students, the dream, I let them interpret it, and then I share my interpretation with them. So in my opinion, the monster in the dream represents the cancer. And students typically come up with that same conclusion. Howard, are there dreams that your students commonly bring to you in your Dreamweaver workshop? So I don't invite students to share dreams in a public setting, because I feel that it's a very personal and oftentimes private experience. So I do encourage them, if they're interested, to meet with me afterwards or to set an appointment. Not a counseling appointment, but just, hey, let's talk about your dreams. So I have had students come up to me after that will share something with me. And I remember one girl, I don't remember the detail of her dream, but she shared something with me. And I simply asked, who were you worried about? Because there was a theme of worry and concern in her dream. And she started crying. And my goal is to never make students cry, but that was actually a really good sign. She was getting at the source. Her mom had been diagnosed with cancer prior to her coming to college. The prognosis was excellent. However, she felt really bad leaving her mom. So she suppressed those feelings of guilt, and they were coming out in her dream in a symbolized way. I did have a student come to me once and asked if he could uh, share his dream. And he shared with me that He had a dream that he is in his house and someone's shooting through the house and he is diving on top of his family members to bring them to the ground to protect them. What does this dream mean? So I asked him first and foremost, is that the house you grew up in? He said, yes. I said, are there drive-by shootings in that neighborhood? He said, yes. I said, has your house been shot at? He said, yes. I said, are you worried about your family? He said, yes. So he is here safe in his dorm going to college, and he's worried about his family. So there was nothing symbolic about that dream. That dream was absolutely reflecting his conscious waking concern. So not every dream is disguised or uh, symbolized. Howard, who are you in the classroom? Hmm. Well, that has changed, certainly. I think when I first started, I was excited but new to teaching. But what I've really come to to learn is I don't have to be the expert in the the only expert in the room, I should say. I don't have to have all the answers. I connect with the students. One thing I've very much realized is how important rapport is. It's not just being an expert in your subject and it's not just being well prepared and teaching the material effectively. It is connecting with students, creating a safe and supportive environment. So I am 100% myself. I am in my zone. I love teaching. I could be exhausted emotionally and or physically and teaching lifts me up. So that's who I am in the classroom. Howard, students learn material and they often soon forget it when the class is over. What is it that you want your students to remember? A lot does fade, as you said. One of the things I really want students to learn from my class is to be better consumers of research, such as information on and commercials about 
pharmaceuticals and depression and depression is a, caused by a chemical imbalance and seeking out medication. I want students to honor their emotions, to recognize that those emotions are there for a reason and they usually only get to a toxic or debilitating level when we ignore them or suppress them. So that's one of the biggest things I want them to take away from my class. Also, I really try to model for them just being authentic. I try to model for my male students that being strong doesn't mean putting on a tough act or wearing a suit of armor. In fact, those who wear a suit of armor are scared and it's real courage to take that suit of armor off. And ironically, it's not just men that put on that suit of armor. Women do as well. So that's one big thing I want them to get as well, just how important it is to be authentic with themselves and with others. Something else, too, is I, I do want students to look back on their experience in my class, even if they don't remember all of the content, which they won't. I want them to look back on their college experience and to remember me and to remember that class with fondness. And I will tell you, I've had students that have graduated that have invited me to their wedding. I have students that want to stay in touch. I'll have lunch every now and then with students. You hear from students, certainly if you're a professor that has moved them in that way. So hearing from students who want to connect or let you know how they're doing or ask for a letter of reference or just touch base with you, that's really, really moving. So I hope I am one of those professors for the majority of my students. Howard, let's talk about your life. You grew up in Maryland. Where in Maryland? It was a suburb called Potomac, Maryland, about 45 minutes outside of Washington, D.C. What do you remember about Potomac? Very friendly place to grow up. It was a suburb, single family homes, middle, upper class families, a lot of stay at home moms, but certainly some of them worked. My mom was a stay at home mom. It was a great place to grow up with my sister, two years older than me. And my dad worked full time for the Department of Defense. My mom, as I said, was a stay at home mom, very involved and active in our lives, volunteered at the library at my elementary school block parties, park at the top of the street. We adopted a dog when I was nine years old. And so just uh, taking her to the park and playing soccer with neighborhood kids, it was just a really great place to grow up. You referenced your sister, Elisa. What was your relationship with Elisa? Like any siblings, we certainly had our ups and downs and our fights, but we loved each other very much. Such a compassionate heart. I remember there was a baby bird that fell out of a nest when it was very young. It probably had just been hatched. And my sister was devastated. She was crying and took the shovel from our garage and was digging up the earth trying to find worms to feed this baby bird. She was so upset and so committed to help this bird survive. There were no worms to be found. We ultimately found local rescue that took care of wildlife. So they took the bird and nursed it back to health. And incidentally, they told us that it was not a robin. And had we tried to feed it a worm, it probably would have choked to death. So fortunately, we were able to get it the resources that it needed. But that kind of captures my sister's heart. Such a sensitive, caring, compassionate person. Howard, at the age of seven, your life changed. What happened? Well, I had been sick with what we just thought was the common cold or chest cold for a week, which led to two weeks, which led to a doctor's appointment. And I remember after the appointment, the doctor asked to speak to my mom privately, which had never before happened. After that private meeting, my mom took me to the local hospital where they were running some tests. I remember getting a chest x-ray. I remember getting blood work, which I was not happy about because it hurt. And next thing I know, my mom had gotten the results. And I remember walking down a long hallway. The end of that hallway was a row of pay phones. My mom was definitely distressed, but she didn't say anything to me. I remember she made a phone call. I was right by her side. She called my dad at work and was sharing something with him that I didn't quite understand. Next thing I know, I was being taken to Children's Hospital in Washington, D.C. by ambulance where my dad met us and I underwent a bone marrow test and spinal tap. I didn't know what they were called at that point. I just know that it was excruciating and it felt like it lasted forever. 
apparently, I know this in hindsight, my parents were told that I had acute lymphocytic leukemia and that I had about two months to live. My dad was in complete shock and disbelief, saying, test him again, maybe it's anemia, but it wasn't. And an intern came to my parents and said, look, there's enough reason for hope. He's at the right age. The type he has has been successfully treated. We're going to do the best we can for him. Don't give up hope. And of course they didn't. And I'm here to talk about it today. So I underwent chemotherapy, radiation, and um, a series of bone marrow and spinal taps until I was 12 years old. So it was a long, a long uh, road and definitely traumatic, altered my life in a lot of ways, but I'm here to talk about it today. So I'm grateful. Howard, how did your cancer affect you as a young child? Well, one of the ways it affected me was it showed me that the world isn't safe. It showed me that my parents can't protect me from everything. And it also showed me that people can be really cruel. Kids can be really cruel. I lost my hair as a result of the radiation and chemotherapy. And I was teased a couple of times, once at school and once in my neighborhood. And some people might say, wow, only twice? That's not too bad. But even once is devastating, and it certainly was to me. So I started a pattern back then of hiding and pretending. I never shared with anyone that I was terrified to go out during recess. Instead, I pretended I didn't feel well to avoid going out. And that really started a pattern of pretending that I was okay. But instead, on the inside, I was terrified. And I really withdrew from life in a lot of ways at that point avoiding things that would expose my uh, weaknesses, avoiding things that would trigger my insecurities, but all the time pretending I was okay. And in fact, it was because I did such a good job pretending that my parents never got me any counseling because they thought I was adjusting very well. This was a pattern that was with you through middle school and high school. Yes, this was a pattern that really followed me through middle school, high school, and even college. It wasn't until graduate school that I I finally uh, started recognizing and truly addressing and altering this pattern. Howard, this pattern of hiding your emotions followed you to college, as you noted, and you hit a wall when you first went to college, didn't you? Yes, yes. Yeah, I went away to, to school. It was less than two hours away from my hometown. All of my friends stayed behind to attend community college. I had a girlfriend at the time, my first serious relationship, and she was back home as well. It was a very toxic relationship, and I don't think I was mature enough to be away at school. So I really was blindsided by depression and anxiety, but rather than seeking help, rather than going to the counseling services, rather than telling my parents, I once again pretended I was terrified and felt ashamed to show what I was truly struggling with. So I did nothing and I ultimately failed my classes and I started counseling at that point once my parents realized everything that was going on and I went home and started attending community college. So between counseling and really just going back home to regroup, I was able to move through that and ultimately get back on track academically and emotionally. Do you share with your students today that you had that experience when you first went to college? I do. Absolutely. Absolutely. I do share this with my students. And uh, I think that's a really good lesson that we can have a significant struggle, even something that one might consider a failure, and pick ourselves up and move through it. And that is the essence of grit. So I love to be that role model for students Howard, did you think of yourself as a cancer survivor? And what did that mean to you to say those words? In so many ways, when I was growing up, I didn't want to be different. Because I had cancer and was surviving cancer, I wanted nothing more than to fit in and blend in. And I think that's where a lot of the hiding and pretending came in. So I didn't like being associated with the term cancer survivor back then. But now I wear it proudly. It is a part of my experience. It has contributed significantly to who I am and the career path that I've chosen and the level of sensitivity that I cultivate and and share with others. And additionally, I have worked with cancer survivors. I've worked with people who have lost 
loved ones to cancer. And in college, I actually, I wanted so much to give back and I wanted to connect with other cancer survivors, but no such groups existed. So I, I contacted the American Cancer Society and expressed an interest in starting a support group on my campus for young adult cancer survivors, partly because I wanted to give back and partly because I felt so different and alone. I wanted to connect with people that understood me. So they informed me that since I don't have a degree, I had even a bachelor's degree, that I would need to have a sponsor. So a professor of mine agreed to do so. And I started a support group, and it was an amazing experience. Unfortunately, I lost one of my members. He relapsed from leukemia, but it was such a special bond, and I realized that maybe I wasn't there for his recovery. I was there to help him through his dying process. So something that has changed me forever, and in fact, I even wrote a song to uh, honor his memory that uh, we played at his memorial service. Howard, in college... You also faced another potential tragedy. You almost lost your dad. Yeah. Yeah, it was 1993. It was October of 1993. And my dad had routine surgery. Everything seemed to have gone well. I saw him in recovery and I went back to college, which was less than 45 minutes away. That Sunday morning, I remember waking up to a phone call from my mom and the answering machine picking up. And I heard her leaving a message that said something along the lines of my dad being in intensive care and don't worry, don't come. I'm going to call your uncle who incidentally lived in Philadelphia. So all of my red flags are going off and I jumped out of bed and rushed to the hospital to intensive care where I see my dad unconscious and he was in horrible, horrible shape and I didn't know what was going on. And I asked the doctors and the nurses, and they said that his kidneys were shutting down. They said that his stomach had shut down and that we just need to wait and see. I was counting my dad's breath, Mark. My dad's breath was labored, and the breaths were few and far between, but they assured me that he was getting proper oxygen. I was terrified, and I didn't know what to do. And I remember sitting in the waiting room feeling like this was a nightmare, and a woman in the waiting room, very talkative, a little bit annoying, just started chatting me up. And she shared with me that her husband had been in kidney failure and that a particular doctor saved his life and that I need to call this doctor. Well, everyone always has someone that they think you should call. So I didn't take it to heart, but she did tell me her name and her last name, I'll never forget, was Miracle, M-Y-R-A-C-L-E. Later that day or perhaps the next day, a nurse pulled me aside from the intensive care unit and she said, I could get fired for telling you this, but your dad's not going to make it through the weekend. And I started crying to her and I said, I know. I said, please tell me, what should I do? I said, I can't go to medical school overnight and save my dad's life. What should I do? She handed me a piece of paper with the same doctor that Mrs. Miracle recommended. So I called that doctor immediately. She came in around 10 p.m. that same night examined my dad, looked at his chart, came in and spoke with us and said, and I'll never forget, she said, your dad will stop breathing by the morning. He needs to be put on a respirator. She said, his kidneys have shut down. We need to start him on dialysis. She also said he's dehydrated because they're giving him the wrong fluids. And then she asked, so what do you want? What do you want me to do? And I said, you're hired. He's fired. And she took over his case and it was still a three-month process and lots of ups and downs, but I still have my dad to this day because of that nurse who risked her job to speak up and advocate for my dad. I'll never forget her. What is the moral of the story for you, Howard? Oh gosh, there's lots. I think part of it is patients need to be their own advocates. You need to have family members there for you as much as possible. And also I think a big moral for me is doing the right thing, even if it means jeopardizing, perhaps jeopardizing your own well-being. I absolutely believe that the world would be a better place if more of us would stand up and look out for each other, even if it means something uncomfortable for us. Howard, you went to graduate school to earn a doctorate in psychology. And while you were there, you wrote a poem. What was the context for that poem? And what was that poem? Yeah, that poem was very much in reaction to this pattern of hiding and pretending. 
it's a pattern that was always with me, but that I honestly never recognized. All I knew is I always felt scared in every social situation, in any situation, I felt like an imposter. It was exhausting. And when I was in graduate school, I found myself surrounded by classmates and friends that were kind and considerate and supportive, which was just so different from what I experienced. I also found myself with a counselor that was wonderful. And I think the timing was right as well. I think all the stars aligned for me to finally take a good look at myself, to recognize this pattern, and to just acknowledge how exhausted I was. So the context for this particular poem, it is about me, but it was prompted by a relationship that I was potentially exploring. And I remember being with this individual and just being extremely nervous. And she saw through my act to try to pretend I was fine. And that prompted the poem. And the poem is called Fallen Angel. Howard, would you mind sharing the poem with us? I'd be honored, Mark. So it's called Fallen Angel. I've gotten really tired of hiding for so long, fooling those around me, pretending to be strong, running from rejection, that's all I've ever known, longing to be loved but condemned to be alone. I was not prepared to meet someone like you. The walls I've built around me, you've somehow seen right through. My heart is paralyzed, afraid that you will see the frightened little child that hides inside of me. But as I hold you close and in each other we confide, I no longer want to run, I no longer want to hide. And the more I get to know you, the more I realize that you've been hiding too, a fallen angel in disguise. What does that poem mean to you, Howard? Oh, that poem is a reminder of how isolating and lonely it is when we are not being our authentic selves, when we are hiding, when we are afraid of judgment, when we play a role in order to gain acceptance and to avoid rejection. We might have lots of friends. We might be high-fiving people. We might have lots of activities and social clubs. However, as my poem says, we are condemned to be alone. It's only through being authentic that we can ever truly connect with others. And that means we need to be vulnerable. What that also means is we need to surround ourselves with people that treat us with kindness and respect and that actually love us, not despite our vulnerability and shortcomings, but because of them. And the beauty of that dynamic is those individuals have been hiding too. And when we make the first move, that will give them permission to be vulnerable as well. And there's such a beauty and magic and true connection that happens with that. Howard, how did you find your way to teaching? All of my clinical training was to be a therapist. And when I was on my advanced therapy practicum, when I was in Georgia, one of my colleagues was teaching at a community college and asked me if I'd like to come and teach just one section of one lecture on a particular class day. So I thought, sure, why not? So I prepared and he lent me the textbook and I came in there and I just decided rather than standing behind a podium, I decided to just, it was a small class, uh, maybe 15 students. I just sat on the desk, Indian style, and had a conversation with the students about these topics. What I remember was the students were captivated and we were connecting and we were discussing and I was sharing and it went so well that he said, do you want to just teach the rest of the class? I was hooked. So I didn't pursue teaching at that point. I finished my clinical training and I worked in various clinical settings, including community mental health and private practice. But I ultimately decided to teach and I started teaching part time at a community college and I absolutely loved it. But I almost felt like I was cheating on my chosen career. I felt like I was copping out by teaching in addition to counseling. But I ultimately worked through that very quickly, actually, and, and realized that they're both important. And for me, the best career is a hybrid of doing both teaching and counseling or clinical assessments, which is what I do now. So I've been teaching here at Johnson & Wales for 13 years and teaching altogether in the industry for probably 16 or 17 years. And I love it. Howard, in 2017, an event occurred that changed your life again. What happened? 
Well, Mark, my sister, Elisa, had moved to North Carolina several years earlier. We were very close, and she came to visit me and really loved the area, was ready for a change. So I really helped her in that transition. She moved into the neighborhood where I was living at the time, so we were literally minutes away from each other. I saw her once, twice a week. And my parents ultimately moved out to be closer to us, so all four of us would get together usually once a week to have family dinners. My sister had started a relationship, someone she met online, and they had dated for probably about two years, and it was a pretty toxic relationship. I was certainly concerned, but didn't feel like I had a whole lot of influence over my sister's decisions and choices, but I was always there for her regardless of those choices. So I was leaving work on March 8th of 2017, about to go to my clinical practice, and I looked at my phone and I saw that I had several texts from her next door neighbor. One was from the wife and one was from the husband. Apparently they had heard a lot of screaming and apparently there were some items in the backyard that looked like they had been shredded or ripped. And they also told me that the neighbor on her other side had called the police early that morning because after a long binge of fighting and screaming, everything went silent after he heard loud clapping noises or door slamming. My heart sank. I called my sister on her landline, couldn't reach her. I called my sister on her cell phone, I couldn't reach her. I called my parents. I said, have you heard from Elisa? They said, no. Why? I said, no reason, just trying to reach her. I didn't want to alarm them at that point. My heart is sinking at this point. I decide I need to call into work and I need to call the police. I told them what I had heard and I asked them to meet me at her house. I hoped it was a mistake, but if it wasn't, I was beside myself. So I drove to her house in Huntersville the police met me there a minute or two after I got there. I gave them a key to the house. They went in, and I thought I heard voices, thinking, ah, it's just a mistake. And then they come out, and they start putting police tape around the circumference of my sister's home. And that's when the nightmare began. They wouldn't tell me anything. They wouldn't tell me anything. I asked them, what's happening? And they said, we don't know anything right now. And of course they knew. Um, I said, I'm not an idiot. I know my sister's gone. Ultimately, they did share with me that she had been shot eight times, and then her boyfriend shot himself through the head. And the nightmare began. Howard, what happened after you heard the news? It really became about survival at that point, taking care of a lot of practical things. Of course, the first thing I had to do was call my parents and tell them the news. I didn't know how to do that. So my parents came to the scene and my dad was very much in denial, yelling at the police. And we ultimately left the crime scene and went back to our homes. I took my sister's cats with me and really became a process of what next. I was the one in charge of getting a crime scene cleanup crew to her house. I couldn't go in there. I had to buy new clothes for her, for her to wear in her final resting place. And that's something a brother should never have to do and a parent should never have to do. So really it was planning the funeral and picking up the pieces. It took about a year for me to go through all of the things in her house. I didn't want anyone in the house. She was very private, and I wanted to respect that even in death. So I went through the house, decided what to keep, what to sell, and what to donate. And it took about a year before ultimately selling the house. And I did a lot of healing at that house as well because it was like a nightmare and almost as if this can't be real. I'm going to wake up and going to the house allowed me to connect with the real emotion that the rest of the day and the rest of the time I was avoiding. Howard, the day after this occurred, you went to work. 
Tell us about going to work the next day. I felt like my reality was crumbling. Nothing made sense. It felt like a nightmare. And I felt like I was drowning. And work was something that was stabilizing. Work was something that was grounding. And I felt that work was like a life raft at that time. And it kept me from drowning in this stormy sea of tragedy. There wasn't an absence of emotion while teaching. It was a distraction, but there was something missing. There was a huge hole in my heart and in the world. And that was with me even in the classroom. Where are you now emotionally? I am better than I was when this first happened, but grief is a process. This type of tragedy is still so unbelievable. There is a part of me that still cannot fully believe that this had happened. And that's why at times I hear myself talking about it and I kind of take a step back. I still miss her terribly. I still can't believe that this has happened. But I've certainly done a lot of a lot of healing along the way, and counseling has been a huge part of that. Honoring what I'm feeling has been a huge part of that, and trying to honor my sister's memory as much as I can has been a huge part of that. My sister was a huge animal lover and a compassionate vegan, and so part of what I have done with some of the money from her estate is to visit various farm sanctuaries and donate money in her memory. So that's been a big part of it. Also, exercise was huge in my recovery. In fact, I had just agreed to hike the Grand Canyon with a friend of mine when this tragedy occurred, and I almost canceled. I thought, how on earth can I train for such a huge, enormous undertaking in the midst of this grief and tragedy? But I decided instead that this was going to be part of my healing And so a lot of my training, getting out at local mountains here in North Carolina, I would talk my heart out. I would hike my heart out. I talked to my sister. I cried to my sister. I apologized for things that I regretted. And while that didn't heal me or help me transcend my grief, I really believe that it helped me survive. And in part, I hiked the Grand Canyon in her memory. How are your parents doing? I've been a a big support to them. We've really bonded together through shared grief. And that I believe has helped us to survive. They are in disbelief like I am. They miss her every day. My dad in particular has a lot of regrets. He should have done this. He should have done that. And the reality is he couldn't have done anything. So I think that's part of the grieving process is what if, and I have needed to learn or I'm in the process of learning to let that go because if anyone could have made a difference, it would have been me because of how close we were, but I need to let that go because if you stay in that place too long, you will never, ever heal. Howard, you survived cancer as a child. You lost your sister to a terrible tragedy. What do you say to people who have gone or are going through similar difficulties? Well, I absolutely think it is crucial to get some support. Now, for me, counseling has been that support. That doesn't mean that's the right path for everyone, but getting some support from someone who is an expert in helping people navigate through difficulties and loss. I also think It's really important to let yourself feel. I don't remember who said this phrase, but it is sort of my mantra. The only cure for grief is to grieve. And if we avoid that process, we can't possibly have the opportunity to do any kind of healing. What I have found is that a lot of people don't know what to say. So they either don't say anything to us when we've gone through a grief or they say something that feels insensitive. I've heard things like everything happens for a reason or time will heal all wounds. And those things aren't necessarily true. Time doesn't heal all wounds. And I don't believe everything happens for a reason. 
I believe that the grieving process and healing process is different for everyone. I think there are some common denominators. So without a doubt, sharing it rather than keeping it inside, seeking help and resources rather than doing it all on your own, and trying to honor the person's memory, telling stories, supporting charities that were close to their heart. Those are huge in moving through the grieving process. Howard, you have a love of animals that you shared with your sister, Elisa. Why is the life of animals important to you? I believe all life is important. And for many years, I consumed animal products, dairy, eggs, meat. There is a blissful ignorance that many of us share. And the industries that sell and promote these products are intentional about that. So I started a gradual process of cutting out various uh, products. Red meat was the first. um, But I remember when I was in graduate school preparing chicken breast for, for roommates. And as I was handling the flesh, a switch went off in me. I love animals. I don't want to contribute to any animal cruelty. And here I am preparing a meal. So I still fed my roommates. However, I couldn't eat. And it was at that point that I cut out all meat except fish. Ultimately, I cut out fish as well. And more recently, in the last six years, I've learned more about the egg and dairy industries and the horrific, torturous experience that those animals are condemned to. And I could no longer stomach that or support the industries that contribute to that cruelty. So I have not only gone vegan, I have really promoted awareness on campus with guest presenters in my classes, with various field trips. In fact, today I just took a group of nine students to a local farm sanctuary with various animals that have been spared the torture and devastation of the factory farm uh, experience. Howard, what do you know today that you didn't know before these events happened to you? Happiness isn't the absence of trauma, tragedy, and loss. It's really about how we choose to move through it. And a key piece of that is that we are not alone and we need to reach out to others. In fact, it has long been established that having close, authentic connection with others doesn't prevent us from suffering tragedy, loss, or trauma, but it significantly decreases the emotional and physical impact that it has on us. And having done this in my own life and finally making the decision to stop running and stop hiding has been crucial in my personal happiness and also in my recovery from these various traumas. Thank you for your time today, Howard. Thank you so much, Mark. Howard Sletsky is a professor of psychology at Johnson & Wales University. He earned a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from the University of Maryland at College Park and a Doctorate of Psychology from the Georgia School of Professional Psychology. And now, a personal word. Howard Slutsky and I have worked beside each other for a dozen years. We have shared what professors at a university share, stories about students, what just happened in the classroom, the strange behaviors of administrators. We have had this running refrain of loving our work while wondering what else we might be doing. There is a topic Howard and I frequently talk about. He and I share this dream that sometime in the not too distant future, humans will stop eating animal meat and flesh. We will stop eating the bodies of cows, pigs, chicken, and fish. We will stop raising animals in unnatural and inhumane conditions for slaughter. The days of killing billions of sentient animals to feed humans would end. Factories that turn intelligent beings into meat, milk, and egg-producing machines would be a stain of the past. All humans would thrive on plant-based diets. The planet and animal ecosystems would heal. I don't know if we will ever get there, but I hope one day we will look back at the enslavement of animals 
with the same horror as we look back at the enslavement of people. Howard is a model of compassion. He visits animal sanctuaries. He donates to organizations devoted to reducing the suffering of animals. He takes care of injured birds. He leads discussions in class about what we eat. He inspires people around him to re-examine their choices. I became a vegetarian in the spring of 2010. It happened after nearly a month of eating wonderful dinners at home that my wife Laura had prepared. Laura is an exceptional cook that makes every meal remarkable. You realize, she said, that everything you've been eating this month has been vegetarian. I marveled again at her many talents and said, wow, I guess so. She nodded and said, well, this is what I'm going to eat and not eat from now on. I paused, calculating future scenarios quickly, and responded, I want to be a vegetarian too. Joining Laura has always been the right answer. And that's been it. Well, not entirely it. From that moment to today, I've learned about our food system, our treatment of farm animals, impacts on the environment, what we see and do not see when it comes to what is on our plate. All sorts of issues arise in our relationship to animals, not the least of which is the extraordinary suffering slaughtering animals for our pleasure inflicts on conscious life. What was a simple dietary decision at home has become for me a profound ethical concern. Have I been perfectly compliant as a vegetarian over the last nine years? No. I had bula base on pasta. I drove through Wendy's once. I had a couple of bacon quiches at a reception after a panel discussion. If I stood before St. Peter, his list might be longer than mine. And I'm not vegan. But over many years, I take comfort in a diet that nourishes me and reduces some suffering in the world. In the March 2019 issue of The Atlantic, in an article entitled, What the Crow Knows, senior editor Ross Anderson writes about animal consciousness and Jainism, an ancient religion whose highest commandment forbids violence against all living beings. Anderson writes, Jains move through the world in this gentle way because they believe animals are conscious beings that experience, in varying degrees, emotions analogous to human desire, fear, pain, sorrow, and joy. This idea that animals are conscious was long unpopular in the West, but it has lately found favor among scientists who study animal cognition. And not just the obvious cases, primates, dogs, elephants, whales, and others. For many scientists, the resonant mystery is no longer which animals are conscious, but which are not. Spend any time with any animal and the qualities they share with humans are clear. They are individuals with distinct personalities with an instinct to live. If consciousness connects life in any quantum way, then we are just as connected to the non-human animals in our midst as we are to each other. Howard Slutsky is a Jain. Well, he isn't, but he might as well be, as he similarly moves through the world in a gentle way. This is Mark Paris, and you've been listening to On Life and Meaning. Additional support for this podcast is provided by the UNC College of Arts and Architecture, celebrating a decade of creative education in the arts and design. Thank you to our funding partners and to my teammates, Andy Goh, producer of the show, and to Chris Curriton, art and media director. This is how you can help. Please write a review on iTunes. It helps us grow our audience. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And become a patron. We are on Patreon, a crowdsourcing platform that allows you to support what you value at a level you choose. Visit us also on our website on lifeandmeaning.com. Thank you for listening.